but I wanted to just give you a sneak preview of one of the other projects that I'm working on. Uh, Frank had mentioned this in his talk a little bit about some viruses, and I know that that's kind of a going concern in Australia because it seems like right now you guys are good for viruses. You don't have any detectable virus load, or at least not the important ones, which are a uh, grow destructor virus, also known as deformed wing virus. So last year we started running a two-year virus study. And so we're just in the middle of this year's data collection because it's summer here, obviously. And we're asking a few different questions with that. So this is a partnership with the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. We want to know how mites, viruses, and mite treatments are related to one another. So a lot of people have studied viruses. A lot of people have studied mites. We know that mites transmit viruses, but it turns out that there's actually quite a few pieces of information that we're still lacking. So we want to know that. And by the way, I'm lucky enough to work at a company that lets me do sort of basic science on top of the research and development stuff that serves the company directly. I'm very fortunate to be able to do this kind of research. So we're asking this question. Uh, we want to know how does colony performance change with different treatments? So how is that related to virus level? How is that related to mite level? And then what happens in terms of things like honey production? So an applied question for beekeepers. And then this is kind of the novel aspect of this research. Do drones actually act as some kind of a reservoir or a buffer or both in some complicated way for virus in the hive? And why do I ask that? Well, we know that Varroa preferentially target drones, right? So they preferentially parasitize drone brood. They also preferentially parasitize drone adults. But what happens later in the season when the colonies stop producing drones, what happens to all those Varroa and what happens to all the virus that's in those Varroa? Well, they have to shift somewhere. So they shift over to the workers. It's at that point that we typically see the expressed version of deformed wing virus. In the fall, we see a higher incidence of deformed wing virus, and that's also when we see colonies collapsing. And is that a coincidence? Well, we're trying to find out. So far, we just have results from last year, which was kind of pilot year. This year, we've run a full study. So essentially what happens is we do all this data collection. Once a month, we go into the field, we do some hardcore brood sampling, and we collect virus samples from drone pupa, worker pupa, drone adults, worker adults, with and without varroa. And then we send it off to North Dakota and then they do the PCR analysis. And I'm sure that most people remember what PCR is or have some idea of what it is from COVID. So far, what we've found as the amount of drone breed decreases, the levels of Varroa Destructor 1 virus in adult workers increase. So that kind of supports what we were thinking. As drone brood decreases, the detectable level of virus in the adult workers increase. And the adult workers are the population that we're concerned about because they're the ones that keep the hive going. And conversely, as the amount of drone brood increased in the colonies, the levels of VDV1 in adult workers decreased. So it seems that at least our preliminary data suggests that drones are acting as some kind of a buffer against the spread of the virus to the rest of the population. Now, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, and we'll see what happens with our data this year. Has anyone any questions? The question about uh, viruses. I am very aware that the data that suggests that we don't have any viruses in Australia, I'm a little bit skeptical about that data because I think in the absence of varroa, at least that's my understanding, the transmission of those viruses is so low that you could well have it here and there in a hive and never figure it out unless you sample hundreds of thousands of hives to find the one that's infected. And so there's a possibility that as varroa spreads, that suddenly out of nowhere, those viruses will start to prop up and come up and become apparent because they are not, have their vector that allows them to move. You on, on that theory. I fully agree. We have evidence of most of these viruses existing well before Bro was a problem anywhere. Like if you go back and you sample bees from 50, 100 years ago, you, you see that there are these viruses already there. They're, they're already endemic. But I think at that point, the bees had adapted to those viral loads and they could deal with them. The, when, when Varroa came along, I think what happened is that it concentrates the titers of viruses. So the levels just increase so much higher. And I think you're totally right. I'm also skeptical that there's no virus at all in Australia. And I do think that that very well happened. You'll suddenly see a detection. Of course, yeah. you know, the, the studies by John Roberts from CSIRO in Canberra, he has looked quite extensively, but he has checked hundreds of hives, not thousands or tens of thousands of hives. Right. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, JP, and the answer, Heather. If anybody wants to know more information, by the way, this is the company website, and this is my email. Feel free to send me 